talk, I live it. I ball, I pivot. I go the distance. I'm so persistent. Man, I want to welcome y'all to another episode of Halftime Radio Show today, man. I am super, super excited about this episode. We got my man Daniel in the house. How you doing? Doing good. Good, man. I appreciate you so much for, for coming on. Daniel was actually, I reached out to him on, on Instagram, uh, and my man was like, hey, this sounds like a, a good idea. Let's let's do it. Let's line it up. And here we are. It's true. Actually, the funny thing about when we met actually next to Soho House was the moment I actually got stood up on a date and was getting back on my motorcycle to go home. It was so funny. That is right, man. Oh, I forgot about the motorcycle. Yep. That is so dope. Dude. I brought the car here, actually. The car is beautiful, by the way. I, I, I'm going to have to put a little picture in the in the in the video so y'all can see what it is man it, what, what is it by the way it's a 1978 y88 uh firebird and i'm telling y'all it's immaculate all it's, gold with like gold glitter on the inside it's awesome it looks so so dope so i'm i appreciate you so much man for for sliding down here and and just being on the show and being willing to share too like that's the whole thing about halftime like we we want people that are gonna come on the show and be willing to talk about you know their life where they're at and maybe that can help somebody else pivot or make some adjustments and that's really what it's about so uh, awesome. with that said man I, I know i know you knew to to the good city of austin man like how's the transition been like wh where'd you move from so i came from virginia beach virginia okay. um bought a house unseen in east austin just for something new i took a new job with my family uh the family office kind of cfo role and with that i had the option to kind of be remote and so I was looking at houses like locally and I was just like, if I can live in any city I want to, I might as well just spend some time in them and just see which one I vibe with. And did a little bit of time in Nashville. I lived in California for a little bit of my life, which was really fun. Okay. Um, visited Asheville, really good vibe, um, but landed on Austin, got a house and then just road tripped here. And I've been here since February. Now you're here. Yeah. And how are you liking it so far? Like compared to like, the, the places that you, I, I know Nashville is kind of similar to Austin, but a little different, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nashville had a very similar energy. Um, LA as well. I think this has like all the good parts of what LA had and none of the bad parts, which is really nice. Um, but I love Virginia Beach as well. I mean, it's a great place to raise a family, which is what my sister's doing and she loves it there. But um, I was looking for a different kind of energy, more young people, more like doing fun stuff, going out. The comedy scene is awesome out here. There's always good musicians and bands in town. 100%. There's just endless things to do, which has been like the main reason I came here. A hundred percent. That's what I do love about Austin, even though I don't live necessarily in Austin. Yeah, I feel uh, you. But it's 20, 25 minutes up the street. And it's like you said, man, it's always something vibrant to do. Yep. So if you look in the mood of Austin, I'm telling you, it's not a bad place, but there's a lot of people moving here. From, it's true from everywhere you know I'm not, I'm not talking about you right like i'm just i'm just saying there's there's people it's this is a i think one of the it's in the top five growing cities oh yeah for sure 100 percent. um especially you know with tesla moving here and stuff like that i mean it's which is great because it's going to provide more jobs you see that it's kind of you know they're already doing work on the i-35 which is very much needed i don't know how much it's going to help but it's needed um, is that what I took to get here? I-35? Yeah. yeah, that road is terrible. Yeah, I, know, I know. I was going like 25, 30 down the highway the whole time. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. And I mean, at, at what time, right? Like, yeah. In know, the middle of the day on a Sunday when no one needs to be driving around. I mean. I know, dude. I, it, I thought it was going to be a nice ride with overcast for the classic car. It's just but, I mean, riding I, second it, gear. It has to beat LA, though. Oh, yeah absolutely but like i didn't even want to have a cool car in la because like it would just get beat up on the road oh, and wow. yeah i had people like even just with the bumpers just constantly hitting me in these parallel parking spots like i, I get it and then they just leave or sideswipe your car and then just leave so in la i just wanted to have something that was like a tank that i didn't mind getting beat up but it's, in austin i didn't even, I didn't even think about that wow yeah, yeah. la is just different Oh my God! I mean, you gotta have real money in LA to have a fancy car. Like, it's just not worth it. And I'm sure, like, the insurance, the gas, all that stuff, it's just like having a garage or a parking spot in general 
I mean, I lived in Venice and Malibu. Uh, Malibu, I know, Malibu was amazing, but I uh, I only did that because I went to grad school at Pepperdine. Oh, um, nice. So I got on-campus housing, which was like a third of the cost to live in Malibu. Yeah. Um, but I lived in Venice while I worked at Uber. Um, the office was downtown Santa Monica, like right over the beach. And so I lived in Venice, and it was amazing. Luckily, I had a driveway. How was Pepperdine? I, that campus is beautiful. Uh, yeah. It's stunning. It gets it gets weird waking up every day looking at that. Yeah. Um, I was just like, I guess I'm not going to live in a more beautiful place than like this year of my life. And that's still to like true to this day. So we'll see what happens. But Malibu was amazing. I was able to surf in the morning and go to class in the evening. It was, I mean, take me back to grad school. It was that's perfect so year. Cool, man. Yeah. And so, so you went from grad school and now you're, um, you say you're working for your family's company. Yeah. Right? You're a CFO. Yeah. So that that's that's pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. Though. Family office CFO. I mean, it's it, whatever title you kind of want to name it. I'm yeah. kind of over finance in the family office, um, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, my it's primarily a commercial and residential real estate business, but we have half our portfolio online as well as um, with private investments, including Crunchy Hydration, what we have here. Yeah, man. And talk to me about this real quick. So, for for those that y'all don't know, man, we got some. We got some raspberry. Um, we'll have to zoom in on this right here. Raspberry, what else we got, boss? We got uh, calm, watermelon, watermelon, lavender, lemon, and lime. Yeah, so it is Crunchy Hydration's um, uh, line of functional sparkling beverages, I believe is the correct terminology for that. Um, founded in Virginia by Megan Riggs, who's awesome founder, and uh, just fell in love with her vision, the product, and just her as being a founder of the company. And so we invested early days and still excited. I work with her all the time and excited to see where this uh, this brand is going in the future. Hey man, y'all be on the lookout for this right here, man. Crunchy hydration, I'm telling y'all, this is gonna be the wave. And, and talk to me a little bit more about this drink. So you said there's like a little bit of CBD in it as well? Yeah, so there's like three, I don't know if I had all of them, uh, two CBD and then two non right there. Okay. Um, the CBD obviously has its own benefits if you mm -hmm. want it, um, but they do have a line of without CBD, and that also comes to like selling it in the stores. Obviously, not all stores or states can accept CBD. Right. So, right. Um, but yeah, they're functional beverages, so they all have different aspects of it in terms of the ingredients um, that make you feel some type of way. So, stabilize, calm, bliss. They're kind of all named after what they're trying to do. That's sick, man. So yeah. talk, talk to me a little bit about, um, congratulations, by the way, on this, man. But talk to me a little bit about, like, how do you go into finding, like, you're a startup investor, right? Yeah. So how do you go into finding, you know, what the right startup is? Like, yeah. are you looking for trends? Are you looking for people? Like, wh like what is, what's, what gets your, what catches your eye? Yeah. So I had a little help with figuring that out early on because for the past three years before I moved here, I was managing an angel investing group. So I had about 150 members in the group where I was the associate director. We set up these events. It's a lot like Shark Tank, the TV show, but like with real people in a real room. And then the companies, three of them would win an opportunity to come pitch live to our investors. And so we'd set it up like a fancy event with drinks, food, and then a stage. And it was awesome. So for three years, I did that. So I was analyzing like 100, 150 deals a year. Wow. Um, so I kind of found that primarily because it's so early with these companies that I, I have to fall in love with the founder. The founders just are not a good fit for me in terms of energy, in terms of strategy, how they solve problems. I know the problems that they're facing today are gonna change in the future as they scale. So if they're not solving the early day problems the way I kind of want them to, then I'm just out. Yeah, It's a way to turn me off. So it's a lot about the founder. Obviously they have to have a good product or idea. Um, I didn't think I'd be getting into CPG just because it has such low margins, especially the exits are just going to be smaller. But with that being said, I fell in love with the product and the founder, and that's where I spend my money. So you spend your money where your heart is. Yeah, and that's dope, man. Because I, you know, it's funny. I heard on a, I think it's a, I think it's 
School of Hard Knocks. It's uh, the Austin based podcast. The guy that oh, I nice. Uh, he um, he interviewed somebody. And I think he said that hundred dollar problems, a thousand dollar problems, ten thousand dollar problems, a hundred thousand dollar problems, a million dollar problems are all the same. It's if you can't handle your if you can't handle a thousand dollars well, you're not gonna handle ten thousand dollars well. You're not gonna handle a million dollars well. It starts small yeah in a way you know and i think that that i when i heard that i was like yeah that's that's dope you know like that's that's pretty cool have you have you found um any businesses that you that you got in that just didn't work oh yeah most of them most of them (laughs) um i mean in the end most of the startups are gonna fail they just are which is a hard number to kind of take in and but the same thing is when you were talking about a previous business you had, mm-hmm. I don't even see it as like a, some type of like when the business stops, it's necessarily a failure. Sometimes it was super successful for the run. You also learned really valuable experience moving forward. Right. And all of the entrepreneurs that I work with are like serial entrepreneurs. There's nothing right. else they'd rather be doing with their time than creating businesses. So like, one business ending isn't always a failure to me. It's just like the story that it tells. Um, but yeah, that's one opinion on that. No, that's beautiful, actually, man. I like that because it's like in a way, it's like every tree you chop down is it's gonna bear some seeds, right? Like some seeds are gonna fall into the ground, and more trees are gonna get. Really yeah, there are effects of yeah. the failure that you don't necessarily see in the moment, but I mean. Most of my founders, if they haven't started a business and struggled through some early day failures, like I'm like, what are we trying to do? You want a hundred thousand dollars from me and you haven't even like had some of these basic problems to solve. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to be able to handle those moving forward. Now, there are some really amazing first time founders that just crush it off their first pitch, first idea. Um, But they're going to be struggling and they're going to be minor failures throughout the whole story. Right. As long as they have enough money to support them through the next fundraise, then they can fail within the story to make it to the next round. But yeah, uh, founders need to face failure. And it's not, I, I honestly don't look at it as a bad thing. I only look at it as like the story that it tells. That's fail. And it's okay to fail. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but I have lost like $10,000 on investments that just the company closes and you have to look at that and kind of suck it up. But with angel investing, like, you know, when you build a portfolio of your own, that there are going to be failures in that and that right. you need the winners to offset those for returns. Mm-hmm. Right. So gotcha. it's it's something that I expected, not as fast as it did happen. But I do expect those and I expect them in the future, not with country hydration. But yeah, not, not, not with country hydration. That That's going up. That's going all the way up. But. Talk to me about a little bit about um, how how do you help navigate a young entrepreneur when the, I guess that spiral starts to happen, right? Like when you start to see like, yo, like it's it's going down, you know, do you feel people are receptive to maybe the harsh criticism, the adjustments that they, they need to make at the board or they very much like, no, like, let me, let me handle it. Like, how do you feel that balance is? Yeah. I mean, so most of the companies that end up working me with me, uh, love me for one fact of uh, that. I don't like beat around the bush. I just give it to them directly. Like mm-hmm. I feel like the situation is. So I am very direct with all my founders now, whether or not they act on that is their choice as a CEO of the company. But I'm always direct in the worst situations when they're running out of money and it looks like the business is over. I'm going to give them my best advice on how we can move forward. And I don't want them to take it personally. They don't ever really take it personally because it is a business decision. And you're just trying to be in that moment, sort of like in crisis management where you have to still come up with solutions. You can't just back off the problem because it got too tough. Right. We're talking about a business. We're talking about employees that you're now paying and they're going to lose their job if you can't figure out how to get through this fundraise. So there I'm always completely direct. And most of the founders, I mean, 
it's a business it's not personal they want to keep it alive so they're willing to try anything you know yeah it's, it's your money too you know what i mean like it's, yeah it's what you have but at yeah. the end of the day like as an investor you can't put some kind of pressure for them to feel bad personally mm -hmm. about it if they lose your money you know it's funny that you say it because you you hear uh, i i hear just like you, you sometimes you see like the instagram and investors that pop up on like your ads and stuff like that right and and um you'll see people talking to a client like they're their own in their own shark tank yeah and they're like well it's well if i'm putting this money into it how are you gonna do this for me and this and this and this and and it's like man like it's it seems like it's all about numbers and money versus people and and ideas yeah you know i i feel like there's been like a there's two paths i guess you can go down you can go down the money analytical route and the you know you know what i'm gonna get in return which is what you're gonna do on the other side as well right. or you can go down the how can i invest in this person and this idea knowing that i believe in this idea i believe in this person and i'm gonna re yield some return back yeah. from it in some way like i just i don't know i feel like there's more people going down down, down that route down the analytical where's my money versus how you're approaching business which, which is like where's the personal relationship yeah you know and that happens in finance constantly more at a later stage so like once you get in the vc game managing a venture capital fund of 100 million dollars of other investor money the decisions are just made slightly different than at the angel level where you're just dealing with like a small single family office and you can make your own decisions and find your own conviction your way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, once a business starts to have like have numbers and has 10 years of business behind them and they have revenue, like the valuation of their business is just going to be calculated differently. And all of the private equity firms, the venture capital funds, they're going to just make decisions on that differently than at the angel level. So that's right. why I really love the angel level because you get a solely kind of like, get behind an idea a concept something that a uh, amazing smart person just brought to you and is like i want to build this company they usually have some kind of mvp minimal viable product to show you or some early traction in the market already yeah. so it's you're still betting on someone with almost no data um which is where it can kind of be an art not a science which is right kind of beautiful the way you're saying that is it's less science, analytical man. and it's more yeah more of an art. Yeah, man. I, ooh, I like that. It's more of an art yeah. to how you go in your entrepreneurial. That's dope. I I like that. I'm going to have to steal that one for sure, man. And how long have you had your motorcycle? I've had a motorcycle since I was like five. Oh, wow. Um, this one, maybe four years. Okay. Five years. Um, yeah, when I started working with 757 Angels. Oh. Yeah, I bought this it's a little gift to oh, myself. Okay, so you were out there riding in Virginia, where it's just beautiful. Yeah, you know, right there. On, and a lot of if if y'all don't know about Virginia, Virginia Beach, man, it is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous out there. And so I'm, you know, when I live in D.C., man, I, I would love to. And anytime I have to go to work in Virginia Beach, yeah, I'm like, let's go. I was so D.C. is not too bad. This is not bad. Like, it's a lot of great food. That's true. A lot of great food. A lot of political food. talk. Didn't like the political scene. And it's just, honestly, a lot of people, too. Like, driving in D.C. was terrible. Yeah. Way worse. I think it's the worst place I've ever driven. Like, the East Coast is just, for some reason, it's just different. Yeah. And I, th I think, really, like, when you get to, like, New York and you get to, like, D.C., like, some of these hot spots where there's a lot of people in these condensed areas. Right. And there's so many different styles of driving you got california you got texas you got dc you got you know maybe montana you know you got all these different people that's like driving so different it, it it's coming here out. and it's coming here and the roads are so slippery when wet yeah i just don't understand it i mean in virginia it was not like this no i'm no. sliding out on like in my forerunner with off-road tires like i don't know how that's possible right it's just you would right. think you would, you would think like well the taxes we pay i, I was gonna say like with cap with cali like you see like the taxes 
I guess Cal- Californians pay. The roads, no. you would think they're not good. No, don't even act like they're I good. Was, I was gonna say when I, at least when I fly out, they are like the, the worst nice areas. It seems like, oh wow, this is spacious. There's a lot of lanes, you know. It. They have the smallest roads, the oldest. They're. So, I don't know why there are so many Ferraris there. Like, oh wow, the musicians and famous people buy these awesome cars, and then they drive them on these terrible roads. I don't understand it. I loved my motorcycle in California though, because I could just like park in the parallel spot in between cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. But like I said, I just I drove around my Forerunner and let it get beat up. I mean, the roads were terrible. I, I, Even in Malibu, I, I would they just, were okay. I would but. expect like it to be like you know, nice. Yeah, I think that's what most people expect. I mean, there are nice pockets, don't get me wrong, but the city as a whole, I don't know that they've done the best job using their tax money on making it beautified. I was impressed with Austin when I moved here in terms of like the parks and the landscape design, oh, yeah. just around buildings, awesome. Oh, yeah. In LA, I mean, these $3 million tiny little buildings that are just absurdly priced, they were built so long ago and there's like no reason to keep them nice. Yeah. So most of the buildings and architecture in LA is kind of boring unless you get to like the really big houses. Yeah, but nobody's going to like I mean, I don't know. That that that, that seems kind of lame though. It seems yeah. like if everything is overpriced all the time, but it's also cuz the cost of living is so high and just like everything is just so high to be out in California, man. It's just like I see why a lot of y'all are trying to move out here to Texas. But it's expensive here now. It is. It start. I was gonna say it is starting to get a little expensive here. Yeah. Um, it's starting to feel very overcrowded in a yeah. way. Um, that's why you see so much expansion that's happening outside of Austin, yeah. which I think is long overdue. I think they should have been done this, but um, especially if this is the capital of, you know. But I think at the same time they want they wanted to keep Austin, Austin, right? Yeah. Keep it, keep it what it was. Um, and you just see it's impossible now. And you just see so much. I mean, even from just Rainy Street, just from three years ago to what it is now, is just completely different, yeah. you know. And it's and it's it's wild to see the changes that Austin is undergoing to become the new city it's gonna be. But at the same time, I would encourage people to say, you know, that there's gonna be a sewer line, and I think that hopefully. There'll be some cool stuff that does come about. Hopefully, we keep South Austin how it is, and yeah, you know, you have the city the way it is. I mean, you got San Marcos right, right down the street. You got some great hikes and yeah, and creeks and stuff you can go into. You feel me? Like this. You think they're gonna like dam up the creeks or something? No, I'm just saying. Like this, it's just like if you build concrete everywhere and you take it's away true. from from the. But that's what I was saying. Austin's doing a good job. They are. They are. I just hope that. They maintain that. I hope they maintain that. Yeah. I, I just. I mean, what? They're redoing the whole river walk? Yeah. Just going to be beautiful, I think that's I'm sure. Be dope. And they're not like doing that for businesses necessarily. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just to beautify the city. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's some, that's, I guess there's some good there's stuff. There's going to be a silver line. There's, there's some great yeah. stuff that's coming. I just. I just hope it doesn't get out of control to where it becomes like then all of a sudden a concrete jungle and now you have only a couple hot spots yeah. that you can go to and now everybody's going to those couple hot spots and it's overcrowded and, and now it's, I love Austin because it's spacious, I feel like, you know, it's, you can, you can be a Zilker and then you can go get in the lake, you can go downtown and it's all within this little 20 minute time yeah you can do it all in the same day yeah all in the same day you know and it's it's that's what's dope and then go hit rainy street that's how it was you know like it, it was cool but now it's like it's changing it is but it's okay changes can't change can't be good so i'm not i'm not i'm not knocking. you say that almost like change is almost never good but it can be good <laughs> that bad good i think it's a million count it up uh,